Hey everybody, welcome back to Environmental Organic Chemistry with Dr. Lisa. Uh, we are into the photolysis lecture now. Uh, this is the, the second part of the photolysis lecture where we talk about the rates for direct photolysis. How would we predict such a thing? Well, the rate, the rate constant uh, for direct photolysis, and remember we use a lowercase k for rates, um, and in this, the, the parentheses here is saying that this rate is dependent upon wavelength, not that it's multiplied by wavelength. So the rate of some direct photolysis reaction is proportional to W, which is the incident light intensity, how much light is actually striking our chemical, uh, multiplied by D, uh, which is a distribution function which describes the average path length of light versus the depth of concern. So this is actually, W is actually the light coming out of you know, that's, that's ambient in the atmosphere, okay? And D is the distribution coefficient. Uh, that has to do with the depth of the water body. Because again, remember, Rene Schwarzenbach is really focused on uh, the water column. He doesn't think very much about the gas phase. It's just not how he rolls. So he is describing this as, um, you know, again, this is direct photolysis rates in water. So in water, you have to worry about the depth. You know, how, how deep does the sunlight go into your water column? right so you know lake superior is like in some places it's like a thousand feet deep certainly sunlight does not penetrate those entire thousand feet so it's only going to go maybe i don't know six feet ten feet down into the the water body surface and so we we need to describe how much of the light gets screened out by the water itself over that depth so that's what this right here is doing for you this is a distribution coefficient uh describing how much uh, light is getting absorbed by the medium and then sigma i keep calling it sigma epsilon here epsilon uh, is the absorption coefficient for your compound so this is this is how much light is coming in oops w this is how much light is being screened out and then this is how much light is actually being absorbed by your chemical and all of these things have specific values at different wavelengths now what hits the earth's surface uh, is different depending on you know a lot of factors time of day and things like that but it also depends very very much on the uh, ozone layer right so here the x-axis is the wavelength and this is our function the z which is equal to the the, the uh, incident light multiplied by d which is the the amount that gets uh, filtered out by the medium and then here is your absorption of your chemical. This is the, the absorption coefficient of your chemical. This is, you know, again, measured as a function of wavelength. So this is where you would stick your chemical, you know, in solution into a little cuvette, stick it into the spectrophotometer and measure its absorptivity across all of these wavelengths, right? And then this is what's actually hitting the Earth's surface. Now, why does this fall off a cliff right here? And we have almost nothing below 290 nanometers that's hitting the Earth's surface, that's because of our friend, the ozone layer, right? So the sun does actually give out some shorter wavelength light, but it all gets screened out by the ozone layer. So nothing below about 290 nanometers is actually hitting the Earth's surface. So if you multiply this curve by this curve, you get the black curve here. You get the area here this is the amount of sunlight that's actually going to be absorbed by our chemical. And the 2.303 here is just a conversion factor to convert um, natural logs to base 10 logs. Don't worry about that. So the point is that your chemical can absorb great down here at these lower wavelengths, but there's none of that light around. So that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how well it absorbs below 290 nanometers because that sunlight is not hitting the Earth's surface. Um, doesn't absorb really all that well over here at 400 nanometers, but that's the light that's available. So the amount of sunlight that's actually absorbed by your chemical is in this black area. Okay, so that's just the amount of sunlight that your chemical actually absorbs. Now we have to calculate from that uh, the, the, the rate of any actual reaction. Okay, so here's our rate constant, and it would be the sum of all the rate constants at individual wavelengths multiplied by the amount of light available at those wavelengths. And then, even when we have that, we still have to take that, here's your Ka that we just calculated above as a function of wavelength. Uh, it's a first order process, so dc dt is equal to minus k times c here. 
but we still need to work in here our quantum yield because again, probably less than 1% of the chemical that absorbs the light actually goes on to react, okay? So what's our take home message? Well, first of all, this is a first order process. DC, DT is proportional to something sort of like a rate constant, if you put all this stuff together, uh, times C, times concentration. So we can treat it as a first order process. Woohoo! That means that we can use it in our one box model. Yay! Okay. Uh, the other take home message is that that uh, people who consider themselves photochemists spend a lot of time doing this stuff, but we are not photochemists. And so we're going to ignore all the complexity here and just to find some some rate constant K and here they're calling it Ka. I might call it Kp for photo, uh, but whatever you want to call it, we would define some sort of overarching rate constant, pseudo first order rate constant for reaction of our chemical via sunlight and walk away. How would we do this? Well, we'd probably have to go measure it specifically for the system of interest. So your textbook, you know, is written by mostly by Rene Schwarzenbach. Uh, and so he gives lots of examples from Switzerland. But, you know, New Jersey is at a different latitude than Switzerland. And latitude has a lot to do with how much light we absorb. Um, and the amount of light that hits the Earth's surface is very different from season to season. And if we were down in Florida, we would be much closer to the equator and we'd have a lot more sunlight. So basically every system you're in, you're going to have to de define a different rate constant for reactions with photolysis. So that's all we're really gonna say about uh, reaction rate constants for direct photolysis. Really, this is the most important part, just to keep in mind that even though your chemical might absorb a lot of light, if those wavelengths are not available, then the chemical's not reacting. The other thing to remember is that even though your chemical might absorb a ton of light, it might not matter because the quantum yield is still quite low. So it doesn't, you know, it's great that you're absorbing a lot of light, but if still, if only 1% of your chemical is going on to react, then you don't have a whole lot of overall transformation. Uh, and the final thing to keep in mind is that the kinetics of these direct photolysis reactions are very, very complicated. They depend on latitude, they depend on season, they depend on the absorptivity of your chemical. And so they're difficult to measure and usually we just kind of do a K observed of how fast our chemical just seems to disappear from our water column. We don't really know how or what mechanism is operating. There's probably hydrolysis involved in that. There might also be photolysis. All of the, the reactions might be sort of wrapped up together into one big observed rate of disappearance. All right, so our next uh, talk, we're going to start talking about indirect photolysis. So I will see you on the other side.